world obsessed with Trump, alternative facts have not had a great press. But it's a century and more since Nietzsche claimed there are no facts, only interpretations. And 50 years since Thomas Kuhn argued that facts were theory dependent. So, is an insistence on the facts the prejudice of believers in their particular truth? Do we have to give up the idea that facts decide the matter? Or are facts essential to science and progress without them only chaos reigns? I want to add, uh, introduce my three speakers on my immediate right, and there's no political implications about this at all, is Barry Barnes, who's a sociologist and co-founder of the influential Strong Programme, an approach to the sociology of scientific knowledge described by inheritors such as Bruno Latour as unparalleled in its importance for the field. He's an advocate of the post kuhnian approach to scientific knowledge and his interest in the distinction between objective facts and intersubjective agreement. You can ask him what any of those words mean at a later <laughs> stage. On my extreme left, if that's the right word, is John Ellis, who's a Maxwell Prize winning theoretical physicist. He's made important contributions in many fields of inquiry, including particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. Joanna, I've got it wrong again already. Cavenna. Well done. Sorry. She's an award winning writer for The Guardian, Huffington Post, London Review of Books, and many, many others. Her latest book, A Field Guide to Reality, recognizes the importance of philosophy and believes that philosophy should be accessible to everyone. Well, I'm going to start with you, Joanna. Whether you think that an insistence upon facts is, in a sense, a religious position adopted by true believers. So there's a line in a novel by Dorothy L. Sayers, which I'll begin with. She writes, facts are like cows. If you look them hard in the face for long enough, they generally run away. And so I want to look at the term, even just this little word, fact, hard in the face. And as soon as we do, we see like so many words, it's full of ambiguities and echoes and even contradictions. There's the understanding that we might initially have of objective reality, the actual objective truth, the facts. But then there's also a meaning from the Anglo-French, feats and fait, j'ai fait, this sense that something's happened, somebody's done something. And this suggests a subjective reality. And this is really important to the debate because it's incredibly difficult to disentangle an objective truth. There's always someone within it, there's someone observing it, there's someone looking at it, someone experiencing what's going on. So the combination of elements in this word fact, I think are really important to the debate. And if we were objective and trans-temporal and we could stand aloft and we could wave ourselves above this reality that we're all in and look across time and space, then it might not really help because we'd find that through the ages, many things have been hailed one moment as a fact and then hailed as a fiction the next. So if we alighted in the 1840s, for example, we'd find that germ theory was definitely not a fact. It was a fiction, which was really irksome to poor Ignaz Semmelweis, who was trying to propound it as a serious <coughs> and factual theory. The poor man was told he was mad, which he wasn't. But then actually he got so insanely angry about being constantly told he was mad when he wasn't that he went mad. And so he ended up dying in an asylum, which is a very sad fact. Meanwhile, though, if you went off again on your celestial vehicle and you came back to the 1880s, you'd find that germ theory is a fact. And Louis Pasteur, who's the progenitor now, is having a much nicer time. And he's being awarded the Legion of Honor and generally being hailed as a great propounder of a fact. And this happens with so many theories, with the ether, which as John can tell you is a fact, one minute a fiction, the next, then a sort of adjusted fact again, and then a fiction, with ideas of um, women not having enough strength to run long distances, which was ostensibly a fact throughout the whole of the modern Olympics, until finally in 1988, they were given um, parity and allowed to run the marathon, and that so-called fact became a fiction. So I'd say as we continue in our quest for knowledge, which is so important, there is this question of when is a fact a future fiction and when is a fiction a future fact? And I think we should look facts in the face in this quest. And we should also remember maybe Chuck Palahniuk, the novelist, his argument that you can build an entire wall with facts and obscure reality in doing so. Thanks.
it's cool enough in here to want to get your hands clapping. Barry, yeah. same question to you, if you would. <laughs> yeah, well, in the debate, I'm going to urge caution in the face of facts, whether they're pressed on you as verbal assertions or pointed out to you as features of the world. But first of all, there's this question to reflect on um, about them, about believers and uh, and the question's too difficult for me, so I, I've decided to answer another one. Um, oh, no, you, and, get, <laughs> you get contributors like this. Uh, my question is, why would believers speak of facts at all? Um, and they do so, in my view, out of a need to sustain their beliefs as knowledge. And they've got that need because shared knowledge is necessary for living with other people, as in human beings always do everywhere and for coordinating the actions of those people and it's this that makes how do you know a more important and urgent question than why do you believe even if you're a believer yourself that's the more important question how do you know now a brief history of the world will fill this out um, in, you've got in, about a minute and a half oh, that's great I was just, uh, in ancient times, priests looked to authority to sustain belief. And they invoked the epistemic authority of sacred texts or deified rulers. <clears throat> in enlightened Europe, philosophers rejected faith in authority and turned to reason instead. Use of reason could lead us all to a single truth, so Kant told us. But it soon became clear that the inner voice of reason spoke differently to different people and could pull them apart as easily as bring them together. <clears throat> well, moving on a century or so, when groups of paid professionals called scientists first emerged in the following century and competed for positions in the hierarchy of occupations, they challenged rationalists to turn away from sterile, internally directed reflection, open their eyes and look around. Everyone has access to the world beyond the eyeball with their view of things. And we can all get together if we look at that world and hope to agree on what the facts are, preferably the facts known to scientists themselves by direct experience uh, <clears throat> but never mind, you check things against facts that way and identify what you've checked as facts themselves. Well, since that time, facts have been widely cited as the epistemic basis of empirical knowledge, although the credibility of this misconceived view is currently in decline, not least within the sciences themselves. From physics to biology, scientists now increasingly rely on models and on statistical methods as the foundations of their ways of knowing. And that means they no longer find it necessary to talk of facts or truths. End. <laughs> It was very cunning of me to leave the only real scientist <laughs> on the panel to the last, not least, I assume, to defend facts. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to defend facts, uh, objective facts, not subjective facts, not sociological constructions, not uh, ways to keep uh, you know, societies on the same page. So uh, you, know, you hold up uh, an apple, it falls. That's, that's a fact. Uh, if you do a particular experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, you find something. That's a fact. There's a question of interpretation whether that's really a Higgs boson or something else. That's still being debated. But you do define something. There is an objective fact there. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sorry to be so sort of old-fashioned and sort of 19th century. You know, no, it's very charming. Yeah, <laughs> I, I may look like I come from the 19th <laughs> century, but actually not quite. So, of course, uh, you know, my anachronistic defense of the existence of, object of objective facts uh, has to 
accept the fact that they have a very limited range of applicability. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.